everyone. I'm Maren McKellen, Manager of Field and Experiential Learning and Study Abroad at College of DuPage. We in the Global Ed Office thought it would be interesting to talk with some of our faculty to get their perspective on the pandemic and how it relates to their fields of expertise. So with me today is Marco Benassi, a professor of speech communication and film for more than 30 years. He has led more than 150 field study courses, both domestic and abroad. His personal film credits include a film shot in his father's hometown of Italy in the hills south of Rome. Marco, thank you so much for joining me today. It's great to be here, Mar, and it's great to see you. Thank you. Thanks for making me uh, be a part of this. this. I've been listening to the global chats, and they've been really very interesting and very informative. So, uh, Thanks. Thank I love them, too. Yes, they've been really great. Well yeah. done. I can't imagine not doing one with you, so I'm glad that you said yes. So, um, Marco, as we are aware, especially, the pandemic has changed much of what we do and how we do it. We're not able to travel the same way we used to. Many of our passports have gotten a break since the pandemic started. Uh, some are using this time to explore places and cultures in other ways uh, through film and television. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how film and television can get us out of our own bubbles domestically and internationally? I, you know, I think we all grow up in bubbles. Uh, whether we think we do or not, or we, we don't, we're, we're all products of our environment, our conditioning, the people we grew up with, and film and television now are, are incredible vehicles to at least get a glimpse of how other cultures view themselves, view our country as well too. So uh, really a, a unique chance to, to, to see the point of view and the perspective of people outside of our country. And, uh, and it's a great way to vicariously learn about and understand and experience another country as well too. I agree. In terms of our access, do you think we get a fair representation of what is out there, or do you think we get kind of a limited uh, well, idea? You know, there's so much. There's so much content uh, today on television uh, and, you know, through Netflix and Amazon and Hulu, and there's so many newer forms uh, uh, developing and newer vehicles, uh, newer, newer channels that are opening up so many more opportunities uh, for content. It's, it's exhaustive, but traditionally, we've gotten the best of what the international community has provided. So unless you really search and look for, for the films of, of, uh, of country, the, the more independent films of country, very often we're getting the technically uh, and thematically and Cinema, cinemata from a cinematographer standpoint, the best that other countries have to offer. So we're not getting everything, but we are getting a, a good sample of what they do well. Okay. Um, I thought about that. You know, we had talked a little bit about uh, Parasite, you know, the film that just came out from, you know, recently from South Korea. And I had that epiphany after watching it, um, that it was one of the first international films I remember thinking, that didn't really have to come from South Korea. You know, it was about something that it was, you know, could be, could have been, you know, from any country. You got a glimpse into the South Korean culture, I'm sure, and I learned something about it. But I just remember in terms of the idea of it, I thought that, wow, that could have been in a lot of different places. Well, I, I think Parasite was really exceptional in terms of people forgot they were watching a movie in Korean and they were into the plot. You're into the story, into the characters, the humor, the incredible drama and dramatic action that took place near the end and the excitement. So uh, it really transcended, it transcended language uh, mm -hmm. and culture, which is interesting because the Korean culture obviously is a lot different uh, from American culture as well too. So that was an exception. And there've been yeah. a lot of great international films over the years, Life is Beautiful and City of God that have taken us into different countries and Amelie from France that, have taken us into those cultures and, and made it into the mainstream uh, of American filmmaking and made it into our theaters and, and people got to see them. But Parasite was a little different, I do, because it, you know, Eastern, Eastern films, I mean, that's, that culture is really different. We, we tend to be more of a European, we're, we're from a European culture, so I think there's, we relate a lot more to, to those types of characters, but it was a great example of, uh, of how film really is universal. Mm -hmm. It really is. It's a visual medium and it's an opportunity to really get a glimpse into a culture and realize truthfully how much more alike we are uh, than different. 
yeah. even though so often we're trying to find ways to separate ourselves and compete with with uh, with other cultures the truth is you know at its at our core we're all very similar as people we have the same basic wants and needs and film is able to to teach us that if you're exposed to it if you open yourself up if you get beyond your bubble and, and take the time to try to appreciate and have empathy with other cultures uh, through their film and television right. these days yeah it's a great time to do it too okay so you've taught a ton of film classes you've had a lot of students you've you know, shared with them a lot of films. Which ones have resonated most with your students? You know, when we're talking about international films, I, I think I may have mentioned this earlier, but City of God from Brazil, it takes us into, you know, their, that, that culture, that very violent uh, subculture. That's always seemed to resonate with students. I continue to make that an offering, an option uh, for students because it's such a great glimpse. You know, the one thing about film that can help bridge the gap and, and, and understanding and create empathy is the fact that you do have an audience, you're, you're captive. It's very hard to get somebody to read novels and books and, and to, to study, but today our, our students are so visual and film is something that they fully understand that if you can expose them to really, to really great, powerful filmmaking from another culture, they're gonna be much more accessible to it. Uh, and they're going to be much more uh, open to it. And then that can really trigger their appreciation for foreign film and get them to explore more on their own. And that's what I try to do. I try to really provide them with great examples of international films from different cultures. So it lights a fire. Uh, and not only to get them to understand the world better through, through the eyes of these international filmmakers, but, but also to just uh, appreciate, appreciate the fact that we can get outside of our bubble, that everything doesn't have to be in English. Uh, that we can truly appreciate, and we have a lot to learn from other cultures. What is it about that film that resonated with your students? You know, why do you? What did you notice about it that that you that made you answer the question that way? Well, it's the intensity of the film. It's the fact that it tricked them to get beyond the subtitles. So many, so many students, so many people still have an aversion to subtitles, and they think, "Oh, I, can, I don't want to read a film." But the truth is when you're watching really great filmmaking, it transcends the subtitles. And when you think back, you don't even remember that they were subtitles. And I think that's what happens with students because the film is so, uh, it won an Academy Award for Best Cinematography and it was a foreign language film. It, it's so beautiful and it's so intense. And you know, a lot of our students love Tarantino. They love Scorsese films. They love drama. They love action. Violence when it's when it's done very well and very effectively and very believably, which it's done in City of God, uh, as well too. It's just I think there's this incredulous feeling that wow, I got completely emotionally engaged in this film, and it's very powerful. It's uh, it's gripping. It's horrifying. You know, it takes us into a subculture uh, that that's uh, you know gangs. The it's an inner city quality. Uh, and, and people trying to fight to get out, and the protagonist that's telling the story uh, is sort of giving a glimpse of where he came from as well, too. And, uh, and there's so many correlations with our own society and, and the class system that exists. Uh, and again, I think the real key thing is it resonates because they're so surprised. Mm -hmm. They're so surprised. And I can't tell you that particular film, how many students have said, I, it's one of my favorite films. I, and I can't believe it that I, you know, I've never really watched the film with subtitles before. And, uh, and, and, and that's, you know, when you can open students up to something, you know, it's hard to do that with Shakespeare. You, know, you really have to give them that opportunity to see Shakespeare wonderfully done. And it's hard to find that accessibility and to get students to have the patience to do that. Because if they, if you could, if you could, they would appreciate Shakespeare and grow to love Shakespeare. That's why he's Shakespeare with film you can do, it's a little bit easier access. There, it's, a, it's, a, it's a simpler gateway. To, and, and you can change and you can open people up, which in essence really is creating this opportunity to help them learn about different cultures, get out of our bubble, you know, and explore different types of cultures as well too. So you might have answered my next question because I wanted to ask you, why use film and television to introduce culture to your students? What does it do? Well, first of all, a film, just like anything else, is biased. 
So the filmmaker has a point of view. So it's, it's important to recognize that just because you watch a film, it doesn't mean you fully understand a culture. It's a glimpse. It's an opinion, just like I'm giving my opinion now. We have so many wonderful film teachers. Some of them have an encyclopedic knowledge of, of the history of film at the, the College of DuPage. It, it's just our opinion, like a teacher. You know, when I, you're in my class, it's just me. It's my experience. It's my culture. Uh, it's, it's me bringing to you my thoughts, my ideas, and then hopefully the students are able to process and develop their own thoughts and their own ideas and maybe be changed or challenged a little bit by the experience that we share. Um, film can do that. Film can do that. It can, it can provoke. It can, uh, it can incite. It, it can uh, create some clarity, some understanding. I mean, it's important that it's just, that it's just a perspective. A really good example would be like the, the movies of, of uh, the Middle East, when you see films that were actually shot in the Middle East, how different than they are than the, the, the depictions we have here. For so many years, I grew up with the Rambos and fun action movies, but you know, Middle Easterns, even Back to the Future, you know, where, where Muslims were portrayed as, these, as terrorists and sometimes in humorous ways and sometimes in very dramatic ways, or we see them through military movies and wars and conflicts. But a movie like Children of Heaven from Iran is a spectacular small little film about a, a brother who's trying to win a race so he can give his sister shoes because if she doesn't have shoes, she can't go to school. You know, it's a simple little film uh, about real people. The father, I believe, is a gardener, you know, and he's, and it's, it's just, again, we get these opportunities, these glimpses to see cultures in a way that we don't ordinarily get to see them in American movies or American television. We get, it to, we get to see from the point of view of the people who live there. And, uh, and that can be very unique and it can be very uh, insightful mm -hmm. for us as people and for our students to, to have that experience and to grow and to, to see things in a little different light. Yeah, it's, I saw that film and I loved it for the reasons that you just said, something so simple, but then, you know, just, that yeah, was a beautiful film. I forgot about that one, actually. Um, yeah. Otherwise, the only thing we really have is, is the media and, and the media is, is portraying things based on, uh, based on exceptional things that are happening in the world, not on ordinary things, not in normal life. So we're not really seeing normal life from a lot of cultures. And film can give us a chance to see a little bit more of the ordinary life or the ordinary person and the experience that they're sharing in their culture, you know, economically, romantically, all those different kinds of things that, uh, that very often we don't have an opportunity to to experience right, just even how they gather around the table like a simple shot about eating a meal you know yeah so you uh talk about differences um so the office that we you know the one with uh steve Carell here versus the office of ricky gervais you know obviously one was a dad you know we got ours because of it came out there but they are very different so flip into television um, do you have any comments about just the differences between uh, just those two and? Uh, well, there's, you know, you mentioned The Office, and which is such a great example of a show that was a smash hit here. Steve Carell, Michael Scott, his character Dwight, and uh, Jim and Pam, and all those relationships, which was born of Ricky Gervais's show that only lasted two seasons. I, I don't know, The Office here was seven, six or seven or eight seasons. I mean, it went on forever. Uh, it was a very, very long running show. Ricky Gervais's show was very short. And if you watch both shows, I think you'll find that the British office is far more cringeworthy. Yeah, and, and if you read about the, because I'm certainly not an expert on, on, on the UK and uh, British humor, but there's a very big difference between the characters in the British office and the characters in the American office. I mean, Dwight is this kind of person that I don't think any of us have ever seen before. Their Dwight, their Dwight is, is somebody that you probably would recognize in your office and would really irritate you uh, in a way that people really irritate us in the office. Yeah. The same thing with, you know, with, with uh, they have Tim, we have Jim. Their Tim is kind of a down on his luck guy. I mean, he's like living with his parents. He doesn't have friends. I mean, he really likes their Pam, right? But it's, uh, but he's not this, he's not this like really charismatic figure leader of the office. 
as well, too. He's kind of down on his luck and downtrodden. And I think the British, if you read about it, and I've had a chance to read, it's funny you mentioned the office, I've had a chance to read about the differences. It's, uh, the contention is that the British office is much more realistic because British people want to see more realistic characters, whereas American audiences, and I hate stereotyping because we're all different as people. So to say every American and every Brit is this way is it's silly. But in general, collectively, American audiences want more of a heartwarming, uh, they, they want the, their characters can be awkward, but they ultimately want to really like their characters as well too. And, and they don't even have to recognize those characters. They could be over the top. Whereas the British characters, uh, they want to be more realistic, and uh, and they're okay. They go dark. It's much yeah. darker. The office, the office, and the British office, the original office, is much darker. The the Ricky Gervais character, David Brent, is far less likable and relatable mm-hmm. than Michael Scott. Um, you don't feel sorry for David Brent. You don't like him, and he's f- funny because you don't like him. Whereas the Michael Scott character, there's always this sense of the comeback at the end of the episode where there's like this, oh, where, where they look at him and they kind of really like him. And uh, in the end, yeah. and he's I, good, I he's agree. confident. Where the David Brent's not really a good office manager, but the Michael Scott, he's a great salesperson too. I mean, he's really good at what he does, even though he's socially awkward as well too. And, and that's just one example, I think, of how you can look at television or film in different cultures and sort of understand a little bit about those cultures and how they view themselves. But again, it's so vast and there's so many examples. It's, it's hard to just pinpoint. We're not talking about math or science here. Yeah. These are just interpretations. And, yeah. uh, and I think that's important to remember too. You've mentioned a couple things because I want to talk a little bit about uh, subtitles versus dubbing. Because I remember, like, to, I have a friend who won't watch a subtitled uh, movie, and I am like, you've got to do it because, you know, language is so much a part of culture, obviously, and just to hear the cadence and the flow of that dialogue, and I love it, but I do think that it, you have to learn, and you have to give it, like, five minutes, and then it'll become, like you said, maybe you won't even notice that you're reading a film, you know, but I do think it's all about how you're introduced to it, and you talked about that in terms of Shakespeare, Right. If you are introduced to Shakespeare or subtitles or something in the wrong way, it can forever impact your willingness to even sit through something. Do you agree with that? I do. I I do think, though, that, you know, we're in such a changing world in terms of media and technology. We just got rid of our television, our television package. I mean, we still have TVs and we're going to watch Netflix and Amazon and Prime and all those things. But literally last week, we cut the cord. You know, we cut the cord a couple of years ago. It was our house phone. Now it's our, so, I mean, things are changing, but I think with, with Netflix and Amazon and these other, these other uh, mediums that people are using, the subtitles, a lot of people are using subtitles back and forth on YouTube. They're using subtitles. We know subtitles now are extremely important in terms of education uh, to allow accessibility to, to all students. Uh, we want to be really sensitive to to students, so we subtitles are, are, are become have become a requirement in in a lot of our classes as well too. Um, so I do think it's changing a little bit. But historically, my experience with subtitles is that Americans like things perfect. We're we're you you know we're used to filmmaking where the mouths move at the exact right time. We don't like anything could jar us out of it. Whereas a lot of these other cultures who have a long history of film, like Italy, for instance, long history of film, film was something that was projected in, in, in the square, you know, big movie houses. And educationally, a lot of these people were illiterate. They couldn't read subtitles. They had to have the movie dubbed. Otherwise, th- that movie had absolutely no accessibility uh, to those people. They needed, they needed um, to hear uh, the, the, their native tongue to understand the movie because they couldn't read it. Uh, so, the, the, I mean, so it's fascinating historically. I, I can't speak for all cultures and how subtitles uh, evolve, but but funny thing about it, like in, in Italy, there were famous actors that were playing the voice of Al Pacino or the voice of Robert De Niro or the voice of Clint Eastwood, where those voices became so immersed in a film because American film, I mean, in Italy and in so many of these countries, they, you can go to those countries and talk about movies and they've seen The Godfather. They've seen all major American films. And they, they, um, 
these actors became famous. And then I remember Heat was a movie with uh, De Niro and Pacino. And I believe this, the same actor, I think this is right, the same actor was doing the voice for both of them. And now they were like, who's he going to play? Is he, is he going to be the voice of De Niro? Is he gonna be the voice? I think that's the story that I heard about that. But you can see, and then when an actor dies, when one of the voice actor dies, and they have to get a different actor, people have grown up with Tom Cruise having this voice. I mean, think about all the movies for 40 years, you have the same voice, and then all of a sudden, the voice is different, or the voice has changed in, in Mission Impossible, and it's, it just, it's very jarring to those audiences. So I, I, I digressed a little bit uh, with the subtitles and talking about that, but I think it's a cultural thing. Um, I do believe that Americans are becoming much more into international film, international television, and I do think all the online streaming with all the subtitle options, sometimes people just, you know, watch the movie. Downton Abbey, I remember the, the second time, I, I'm a big Downton Abbey fan, the second time I binged Downton Abbey, I did it with subtitles because there were so many sayings from the early part of the, of, of the 20th century, so many characters and sayings. And then I would pause it and I would look up who was that character in history or who were they, they referring to? Or they had some slang, a little term cast off a side that one of them would make and I would look it up. And I needed the subtitles really to get the nuances, the actual wording of, of what they were talking about. So I think we're changing. I think we're evolving. I think we're becoming more open mm -hmm. to uh, other cultures. Two times to, at Downton Abbey is a huge commitment, Marco. I applaud you for that. I agree with you with that learning about, yeah, I love that show too. You know, especially, if, you know, what's a weekend? I feel like that now. We can all relate to that with the pandemic, right? Right. Big right. time, I think Maggie Stone was the one, not Maggie Stone. Uh, Maggie Smith. Mag Maggie Smith said, you know, what's a weekend? After one of the people uh, said something about she was looking forward to the weekend. And it just, I thought that co that comment was so funny. Yeah, I think, I think the one character, Matthew, uh, says, you know, I can always work on the weekend. Yeah. And, and she's like, what's the weekend? What's, <laughs> what's the weekend? Yeah, I know. It's, well, class, right? It's huge class system. Exactly. That movie was all about class system. And, uh, but it was, but you're right. You know, the Spanish flu was a big part. An entire yes. season dealt with the Spanish flu. You know, when I watched that a couple of years ago, I never, I was in thinking <laughs> pandemic and literally yeah. our, our coronavirus is, is sort of mirroring that from a hundred years ago, that experience of being isolated and quarantined and people, people dying. And so it's yeah. it so a, a good, good segue to uh, my last question for you that, you know, I imagine much of what you've talked about today in terms of film and television to get an understanding of culture and people uh, can be related to what we're going, what's going on now with the Black Lives Matter movement. Do you have any thoughts on that? You know, what can we do to learn more about that? Well, I mean, I, again, I think film is, is a, a really wonderful medium to help understand a lot of the recent events, many of the recent events, many of the people that they're talking about uh, over the past, several years have been depicted in films. I mean, I think of the documentary, Central Park Five, uh, and, uh, and there's a follow-up. There's a follow-up, uh, a, fiction, a fictional film, that, that, uh, they, how, they view, how They See Us. I think it's How They See Us. Uh, but uh, Fruitvale Station, which was Michael, Mike, uh, Michael B. Jordan, Michael B. Jordan? Uh, uh, his, a breakout film for him that talks about when he was killed in San Francisco, yeah, and that experience. I mean, there's so many incredible films, not to mention just the historical films, you know, like Selma and Malcolm X and all these different films that are so powerful to help understand uh, the perspective of, of, of the, the black community a little bit. And again, those are, those are, the, those are filmmakers uh, that, are, that are choosing, that are editing, that are creating these storylines, but there's so much in film. Um, you know, I teach an intercultural class where we get into race and we talk about race and we'll watch Moonlight uh, as, a, as a class and talk about uh, sexual orientation in the, in the black community or well, and not only the, the, the black community, but, but, but looking at all the different things that relate to culture as well that we can learn through film, uh, like age, like religion as well, uh, social, socio, socioeconomic condition, ethnicity, uh, Ability, yeah. even ability. So all those different areas of culture that, that really affect communication. They affect how we communicate. We see people 
uh, we see a black person. And obviously a black person is viewed differently as we've seen in our culture when they're seen on the street or, or when they're approached or when they're seen in their apartment even or all these horrible examples of, of what have, what's happened. Uh, I mean, really for centuries, this is not just, <laughs> this is not just this last, last uh, horrible episode. It's just this last horrible episode was so clearly depicted through video right through video and you know some of the the incredible footage of of the officer kneeling and and hands in the pocket those visual images were just so powerful and i believe it was really a tipping point a tipping point that perhaps a lot of people that still resisted or still felt that you know, that maybe it wasn't is that things had been solved and things are okay now Maybe, maybe they realized a lot of, not everybody, unfortunately, but, but a lot of people realized that, um, okay, I get it. Uh, they get it. And film can do that. It can really sh help you understand uh, movements and, and events and provide some context uh, for learning and f for growth and for evolving. And it's such an easy way to educate yourself. Um, I mean, and there's other ways too. Obviously, we need to be better read. And we need to, to increase the diversity of, of, the, of the resources that we watch, to learn, to get our news, to, to explore ourselves. Our, and, and we all have to look inside of ourselves, too, and, and, you know, can't pretend like we've figured it out. Oh, you know, I've, I've figured it all out. You know, I'm sure there's still things. I came from a very, very conservative community here in DuPage County, um, and... There was a lot of conditioning uh, growing up with, and it, it, it really forces you to sort of look at yourself and investigate yourself and say, uh, how loving am I? How kind am I? Yeah. How, it's a good time to do a lot of listening. Yes, it really is. It really is. And, uh, and, and film and television can give us an opportunity to listen mm -hmm. and to watch and to, to, try to, to try to grow and to try to create some self-awareness uh, that can help us communicate better and, and, and beyond that, though, they can help us help, help, you know, to, to make us all better and safer, all of us. Okay, Marco, we're winding down. Um, is there anything that you wanted to answer that I didn't ask? Uh, anything you know, more to add? Just, I, I just think it's, no, I would just reiterate how important it is to just get, get outside of your bubble. Uh, for all of us, me too, you know, to really explore and to grow and to push yourself to, to understand different cultures, whether it's here at home uh, with black, the black Americans and Black Lives Matter or our Native Americans and, and the plight that they deal with uh, and what, you know, in, in our, in, and to understand our history and where all this has come from and uh, how much better we can all be, myself included. At, at, it's helping and making things better and appreciating each other at loving each other and recognizing that we're all very similar at our core, you know, what our wants are, what our needs are, and to, to just appreciate the beauty and our differences uh, physically, but that intrinsically inside of us all, how we're, we're still, we want to be loved, we want to be creative, uh, we want to be happy, we want to be healthy. Want to, want to be heard. Have, want to be heard. Want to mm -hmm. have relationships. I mean, these are those are tough, ambitious goals. Uh, but something that I've certainly been really thinking a lot about in trying to to move forward. It certainly is affecting me and how I'm teaching my classes too. Good segue to my last point. So I wanted to thank you so much for uh, taking the time to be here with me today and. Marco, you have a fall class that focuses on intercultural communication, and you and I both have plans for you to return to Kauai in the spring to teach those concepts in an experiential way. So um, anybody out there interested in that, those are, those are available. And uh, Marco, thank you so much again, and I appreciate your wisdom and uh, sharing your, uh, some of your thoughts about film and television with us today. Thank you, Maren. Thanks for all your work, too. And I uh, appreciate the opportunity to, to share my thoughts and my opinions. Thank you. Stay safe, everybody. Mm -hmm.